Happy St. George's Day, ladies and gentlemen. Last year, I didn't have enough time to make a proper video for St. George's Day, but I did say I would make a proper video this year. And so, here it is. For this video, I did consider an examination of another artwork made by an Englishman, but then I thought of something better. An examination of the story of the patron saint of England, the myth and the legend of St. George himself. Most people will be familiar with the story I was first acquainted, which goes something like this. Once upon a time, in a land far away, there was a kingdom terrorised by a dragon. It would go about the land, burning houses and villages to the ground in search for food. Desperate to stop its attacks, the king and queen ordered that sheep be fed to the dragon to satisfy its hunger. A sheep per day. And this worked for a time, but soon there were no sheep left, and the dragon began to attack the kingdom once more. With a heavy heart, the king decreed that lots should be cast each day to determine whose son or daughter should be fed to the dragon to keep it at bay. Upon the very same day this new law was put into effect, the king's only daughter was chosen by the lots. With much sadness, she was tied to a tree and left for the dragon, who came each night to be fed. As the hours passed and the sky grew darker, the more the king and queen's sorrow grew, and the more their tears fell. But then, a questing knight called George arrived at the castle, and stated his intention to slay the dragon, and he was directed to the tree where the princess was bound. He arrived just in time, for the dragon had just appeared over the hill, and was already eyeing his feast for the evening. George and the dragon entered into deadly combat, and many a time did it look as if the knight would fall to the claws and the maw of the great lizard. But nevertheless, he triumphed and slew the dragon. After killing the dragon, he went back to the castle, accompanied by the princess. For the rescue of both the kingdom and the princess, the king offered his daughter's hand in marriage to George, who accepted. So the dragon was slain, the kingdom freed from its tyrannical reign, and George and the princess were wed, and they all lived happily ever after. This is the basic story most are familiar with. However, the origins of the legend are far older, and far more complicated than they first appear. The tale of St. George and the Dragon is not a simple fairy story. Of course, it is debatable whether fairy stories are ever simple. With this video, I intend to provide a brief explanation and rather abridged history of how the myth came into existence and how St. George became the patron saint of England. As well as England, St. George is also the patron saint of several other countries, such as Malta, Ethiopia and Georgia and St. George's Day is celebrated in other countries as well, but I'll only be discussing how St. George came to be the patron saint of England. I'm not currently informed a great deal of the saint's history with these other countries. All of the information I am about to share comes from this book, St. George, Hero, Martyr and Myth, by Samantha Riches. The book isn't long per se, I managed to read it in one sitting. However, there is a lot jam-packed into it, so this is not a comprehensive overview of the history surrounding the legend of St. George. Therefore, I am going to leave out many details and simplify things here and there, so this video does not turn into an audio version of the actual book. If you haven't already, turn on the kettle and then we shall begin. The myth is thought to have its origins in the Middle Eastern countries around the Mediterranean Sea, Palestine, Syria and Anatolia, modern day Turkey. There is no definitive or authentic account which determines beyond doubt St. George's nationality. In fact, there are no accounts which even prove St. George existed. The character of St. George appears to be a fiction, but as we shall see, real martyrs and events did inspire and help create the legend we know as St. George. The accounts of the original legend are found in both ancient Greek, Coptic, and Latin. The original myth was a saint myth, specifically a martyr myth, and didn't have a dragon, but instead told the story of a Christian Roman soldier who guarded the emperor himself. This suggests he might have been a member of the Praetorian Guard. He and the rest of the Praetorians were commanded by the emperor, whose name is different depending on the account, to offer sacrifices to the Roman gods, and St. George refused to do so. For this, he was tortured, imprisoned, and then finally executed. However, his faith and the courage with which he bore his suffering converted both the emperor's magician and his wife to Christianity. The sources which inspired and created this legend are scattered all over the place, 
Many influences shaped this early story, and many more changed the legend over time. The story, which seems to have inspired the early tale of St George the Most, was an account of a martyrdom in Nicomedia in the 4th century, under the reign of Diocletian. In 303 AD, an edict was given which effectively outlawed Christianity across the Roman Empire, and a historian called Josebus wrote that when the order was published in Nicomedia, an unnamed man of high rank publicly destroyed it. For his trouble, he was the first Christian in the land to be martyred under the terms of the edict, which meant he was tortured, imprisoned, and executed. The original tale was of a less fantastic nature than the one with which we are accustomed, but it did not take long for the martyrdom itself to become rather fantastic. St George was not merely tortured, imprisoned, and then executed, many things started to happen in between, namely miracles. Details were added to the tale, such as the magician character, who offered St George a cup of poison. Presumably the poison was magical. St George prayed and then drank the cup without any negative effects. This minor miracle, which of course is only one of many in these stories, caused the magician to convert to Christianity, and the emperor executed him for his change in faith. As time went on, other tales attached themselves to the legend, including the dragon. The dragon part of the myth took place before the martyrdom, and was perhaps a homage to St George's profession in the Roman military. Nevertheless, the story still differs from the one with which most are acquainted. In this later version of the legend, which came into existence around the early medieval period, St George is on his way to serve the Roman Emperor and assume a higher military office, and comes across a small kingdom ravaged by a dragon. He offers to slay the dragon, but only if the entire kingdom agree to convert to Christianity and get baptised, including the royal family. The kingdom agrees. St George slays the dragon and then baptises the entire kingdom, and oversees the construction of a cathedral before embarking once more on his journey. He is later tortured and martyred by the Roman Emperor in the manner previously described in this essay. Before continuing, it is important to note that around this time, the St George Cross, which of course is a red cross against a white background, was becoming increasingly associated with the saint, and as with other saint's crosses, was used to distinguish him in both paintings and glassworks, which always had multiple saints and biblical figures. There is a misconception that the legend of St George was not widely known in Europe until around the Crusades in 1096, where many Europeans arrived in the Middle East and encountered the saints of various Middle Eastern churches. While it is true that the Crusades helped to popularise St George, it is not true that people in Europe did not venerate the saint previously. There is evidence that St George was known in Western Europe during late antiquity, and in England before 1066, and the rather famous Norman invasion. As the early Middle Ages transitioned to the High Middle Ages, St George slowly started to change as a symbol. He still remained a Christian and a saint, but he also began to turn into an exemplar of chivalry and knightly virtue, and so the warrior aspect of the figure began to receive special attention. And this is where we can try to answer the big question. How did St George become the patron saint of England? It appears that during the medieval period, towns, regions and countries had a habit of claiming various saints as their protectors and patrons. In the Middle Ages, several French cities and regions claimed St George as their patron saint for presumably no other reason than they liked the saint in question. So it was for England and the English monarch Edward III. Edward III was a warrior king, and especially admired St George. In 1347, he established St George's Chapel at Winster Castle, and also formed the Order of the Garter, which had St George as one of its main patrons. These two decisions by the Crown of England resulted in St George becoming associated with the royalty of England, and by extension, the rest of England. In 1349, Edward III held a celebration for St George in April, which would begin the establishment of a long tradition in England, although it's perhaps fair to say that St George's Day was probably celebrated previously in England, but this nevertheless was an important event because it was celebrated by royalty. Perhaps more famously, Henry V was also an admirer of St George, and when Harfleur was captured by his army in his campaign against the French, the banner of St George stood alongside the royal standard over the front gates. 
Irregardless, there was never an official point at which St. George was declared the patron saint of England, nor a moment where it was decided his flag would represent the nation of England. It would appear this was a slow and organic development. In the high and late medieval periods as well, various religious and mercantile guilds formed around St. George and were involved in various activities and trades. But most importantly, for our exploration of St. George, these guilds would hold celebrations for St. George in April. The most important of their celebrations was the riding, where actors and actresses would dress up as the characters in the story, ride through the centres of public life, such as the town square, and then reenact the slaying of the dragon. Some of these performances actually cost a good deal of money. There are surviving financial documents which concern the expenses. One such document detailed the amount of money paid to an actor who was playing in the dragon with gunpowder. Fair to say, these guilds almost certainly played an important role in defining the festivities of St. George's Day in England. When England was a predominantly Catholic nation, many saints other than St. George were celebrated. In 1536, when the Reformation began in England under Henry VIII, many saint days were removed from the calendar. The majority of these were saints which were not found in the Bible, yet one of those that wasn't removed was St. George's Day. In 1552, the Bishop of London said St. George's Day shouldn't be observed. But nobody appears to have listened to him. The story doesn't end here, though, because several works were published which made St. George an Englishman, and so further tied the saint to the land of the English. Depending on which version of the story you read, St. George came from either Palestine, Syria, Anatolia, or even Egypt, and the events involving the dragon and the martyrdom itself take place somewhere around the Mediterranean Sea. However, myths and legends in a tradition which is mostly oral, and in societies with relatively high levels of illiteracy, have a propensity to become localised, hence the details of where and when and how change, so the story takes place closer to home. One English tale of St George maintains George slew the dragon on Dragon Hill in Uffington in Oxfordshire, and one can tell where the dragon's blood pooled because no grass will grow there. But perhaps the most important of these works with St. George as an Englishman is the tale found in Richard Johnson's Seven Champions of Christendom, written between 1576 and 1580. In this version of the story, George is the son of Lord Albert, who is the High Steward of Coventry. At a very young age, George is kidnapped by a witch and imprisoned along with six other champions of Christendom. St. Andrew, St. Patrick, St. Dennis, St. James Boanerges, St. Anthony the Lesser, and St. David. George grows up and is hungry for adventure, and basically kills the witch who has kept him and the other six saints captive. They then journey together, until they reach a crossroads, with seven separate paths. Destiny clearly calling, they all take a different path. St. George goes to Egypt, where he rescues the Sultan's daughter, Sabra, from a dragon. The Sultan had promised to give Sabra's hand in marriage to St. George for the deed, but Alamendor, the king of Morocco, persuades the Sultan to send St. George to Persia to deliver a letter. The letter asks the King of Persia to have St. George killed. The King throws him to the lions, but George kills them with his bare hands and escapes. On his journey back to Egypt, George enters a realm where he discovers St. David is under an enchantment, and he breaks said enchantment by drawing a magical sword from a stone, and then he continues to Egypt. It takes him seven years, but he arrives in Egypt finally, and finds his true love, Sabra. She has been married to Almindor, but she managed to keep her virginity safe with a magical golden chain. They elope to Greece, meet the other six champions of Christendom, go back to their homelands, each raise an army, and then together conquer Persia, Egypt, and Morocco. St. George rules over these lands for a while, but he chooses regents to rule in his place, and returns to his wife in Coventry. They have a long and happy marriage, and have three sons, including one guy of Warwick, then, Sabra dies in a horse-riding accident, and George goes on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He returns to England, and then fights a second dragon. He and the dragon both die in the fight, echoing the tale of Beowulf. One can see the many influences at work in this version of the story, not least, perhaps, the chivalric tales of King Arthur. Apparently, Seven Champions of Christendom was very popular at the time of its release, and indeed, we can see its influence on the simple story of St. George, which most English children are acquainted with. It has the main elements, an English king who slays a dragon, and marries a beautiful princess, and more or less lives happily ever after, 
With little overt reference to Christianity, the Seven Champions of Christendom is also missing elements of the original Martyr myth. St. George is a champion of Christendom, and still dies heroically, but it is difficult to argue that he is martyred in this myth. It can be argued that the common conception or understanding of George and the Dragon in England today is a purely secular one. The martyrdom is rarely focused on, and all performances held on St. George's Day in England are about the dragon slaying, and don't normally mention the part at the end where George baptises the kingdom and converts them to Christianity. One could argue that Christianity has for the most part been stripped from the legend in England. This seems for the most part to be undeniable, and yet there are two things which haven't gone and can be considered Christian. First, it isn't called George's Day, it is called St. George's Day, and the recognition that he was a saint is a recognition that he was a Christian. Second, the symbolism. The book I have been using to inform my essay doesn't mention this explicitly, but this is something I have read elsewhere, although I cannot remember where exactly. Many, many church windows tell the tale of St. George, and many wall paintings, stone and wooden carvings also tell the story in multiple churches across Europe. Iconography and symbolism have deep roots in church history, and it has been argued that the tale of St. George tells a metaphorical story as well as the account of a supposedly real saint. In one metaphorical understanding, the dragon represents the devil, St. George, Christ Jesus, and the trapped princess, the church, who is the bride of Christ or mankind in general. In this allegorical interpretation, Christ is the one who defeats the devil, saves his church and his followers from sin and eternal imprisonment. It has also been suggested that the dragon represents the devil, but St. George is representing himself, and the princess is supposed to be Diocletian's wife. In the original martyr tale, St. George's courage and death convince both Diocletian's wife and his court magician to convert to Christianity, and are thus saved from eternal damnation. If this is the case, then this is just a fantastic, metaphorical, and epic way of telling the story of St. George's martyrdom, and the subsequent salvation of Diocletian's wife and court magician. Or it could be both of these things. Nevertheless, it is easy to see how Christian ideas influenced the depictions of the St. George story, and I would posit the possibility that the story is essentially Christian in its underlying form and in its representation. But let us return from the realm of musing and speculation to the real world. St. George and his flag have become symbols for England and her people. St. George is a source of pride and a figure who inspires courage and virtue, and I think this is why he has such great appeal to the English. Much can be said for the forces of deconstruction wrought upon English culture and identity by those who hate the indigenous English. And perhaps the vilest thing these subverters have done, alongside attacking the Englishman's heritage and birthright to his country, is claim that there really is no English or British culture, or that there is no English spirit or zeitgeist, that there is no English character. Some even claim there is no such thing as an indigenous or native Englishman, and that anyone can be English. I do not agree with them. As far as my limited senses can tell, and as far as my limited vocabulary can explain, there is a distinct character to the English people. They possess a disposition towards fairness, good and honest work, to sport, fair play, good manners, and solid friendships. They have a clear love of the simpler things, and there is a modest, understated, and restrained manner with which the Englishman holds himself, which I do not see so strongly in many people from different nations. This national character is not only evident when you see groups of Englishmen socialising together, but I think it is visible in both the history and the art of this incredible ethnic group. The English people, much belittled, spat on and denigrated, by both elites in the government, the media, the universities, and by some of the non-English who live in England, still remain some of the noblest people on planet Earth. I think the English people are too reserved and humble to acknowledge the great things they have achieved, and the beautiful things which make them what they are. But it might do some good if Englishmen were less humble on St. George's Day, and it might do some good as well if they were to take a step back and reflect upon the beauty of their land, heritage, culture, and nation. Thank you all for watching. I wish you all a happy St. George's Day.